It's a musical theme in this week's show. Webb Wilder, fictional character, come to life. A little big store in Raymond and a Grammy Museum in Mississippi. Down Mississippi Road. I'm Walt Grayson. Welcome to Mississippi Roads. We're coming to you this week from the Hines County town of Raymond. Raymond was the site of a big Civil War battle, and there's some of the buildings downtown that still have the scars and even blood stains to prove it. But the building we're interested in is the one right behind me over here. This is the little big store where they sell vinyl records. All of our stories today pertain to music and musicians. And our first story may be about Mississippi's most unusual musician in that he started out as a fictional character. He was a private eye in a student film, then gained a cult following on late night television to the extent that he became real. And we know him today as the hard rocking, guitar wielding man about town, Webb Wilder. Webb Wilder is the last of the full-grown men, the last of the boarding house people. A poor-eyed guy who doesn't smile a whole lot, but doesn't frown much either. A guy who knows every thrift shop and plate lunch joint in town. Webb Wilder is an electrifying artist. Well, I remember being a kid in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and listening to WXXX Radio, Triple X. They would play all the stuff we love, you know, Motown, Stax, the Beatles, the Stones. My mother was very perceptive, and, and she asked me when I was in the sixth grade, would you like a guitar? It was really kind of odd, you know, and then I'm, she may have regretted it. And so I got the $17.50 plywood silver tone guitar, would go over to this guy's house who was in high school. There was no formal music thing to it at all. You know, it was very folk tradition. You know, he would, in pencil, write down the lyrics to a song that I might kind of know how it goes. And he would write the chord change over the words. So it was always singing and playing at the same time. I quickly wanted an electric guitar, and I wasn't any good at all on acoustic guitar. And I asked my dad for electric guitar, and he said, and my father knew nothing about music. And he said, well, you can't even play a manual one yet. Bobby Field mentored me in so many things pertaining to music and performance and stuff and has a very fertile imagination and he and I were watching a lot of Andy Griffith and reading these Raymond Chandler detective novels and he was working at the University of Southern Mississippi in a media capacity and he had a film student assistant, Steve Mims, who needed a senior project. I had to make a film that semester and I wound up incorporating a character based on Roger Highwind Suggs. And a friend of Bobby's, Webb Wilder. I am Webb Wilder, Private Eye. I had bought a hat that was sort of like this. That kind of caught his eye and... He had that hat, you know, that's in the movie. It's just like the greatest hat, and he would put it on, you know, and he's such a good actor and comedian, and Webb just kind of developed a visual character. I sent it to the USA Network, and they picked it up and played it in a late night program called Night Flight. Suddenly, I'm this guy wearing a hat and I'm Webb Wilder. I come from a family of big talkers on both sides. I was playing gigs at the Hattiesburg Teen Center. <laughs> there was a high school girls sorority called the ICH, the Independent Chicks of Hattiesburg. <laughs> I was kind of a class clown in school, and my mother was not really a funny person, but she had a lot of regional colloquialisms and figures of speech in her way of talking. And you know, my mother grew up in the country, so there were a lot of poultry metaphors and things. So uh, Bobby Field and I wrote Hidden Where It Hurts, and we got a bunch of her stuff in there, like a whistling girl and a crowing hen always come to the same sad end. Say a whistling girl and a crowing hen always come to the same sad end. Your hair's a scare, your dress is a mess, got my eyes, your eyes shall find on your brow. Eccentricity is rampant in the South. So that was all around me, and I was always kind of a hyper observer of all that. Some people think that I came up with all the funny stuff, all that, but 
not, that's no way true at all. Like people say, well, where did the credo come from? It was Easter weekend of 1985. We were coming back from Jackson. The credo, he just basically said the whole thing in one burst. I had no forethought of crafting it or saying it or anything. But we were practicing interviewing. We had one of those boom boxes that had the built-in mic and all, and, and he had the foresight to think of this. And he said, you know, you're probably gonna be doing some interviews and uh, let's role play, let's, uh, let's simulate one. So I asked him some question. And I thought about a second or two and, and I just said it. Work hard, rock hard. Eat hard, sleep hard. Grow big, wear glasses if you need them the Web Wilder credo. Everybody just howled and, and Bobby said it was just a magic moment when that happened. So he was always coming up with stuff like that. My best ideas are always spontaneous. I just often don't remember them. And luckily that one was recorded. All the stuff that they would come up with, how to describe our music and the press and stuff like Swampadelic. It'll bend your mind and realign your spine with Swampadelic Mississippi Modern Animalistic Rock and Roll Bop. So we'll just call it Mississippi Modern. That was always the word passed around in the van for years. Bobby Field, R.S. Field, is such a big part of my story. That term Mississippi Modern is something he used to use early on to describe the sound. All right, folks, just to make ourselves at home and have a snow cone. Enjoy the show! They put me on the cover of the USA Today Show the world what the human data file got to say. But everything always really stayed in that kind of British pub rock kind of thing. And so it has that kind of pub rock angst to it, you know, and then it has the rockabilly, revved up rockabilly thing to it. He brings out the best of what Mississippi music has been and it's rooted in so many sources. We just did the sound check and we did kind of a ballad song that I would see as kind of an R&B song. A, a really good R&B song could also be a country song and Ray Charles proved it better than anybody. I came up in an age when what now is referred to as the classic rock era embraced all sorts of eclecticism. Therefore, that's kind of why it's all rock and roll to me. And I, I like a lot of different things, but it, it comes through our filter. And how you combine those elements is really your only shot at originality now. Almost every song on the Mississippi Modern album has a full circle aspect or a long reaching back thing. Like for instance, this song, I wrote it with a great songwriter, Dan Penn, uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago and I said well what do you want to do you know and he said uh, I've been wanting to write a song called only a fool I said okay just like that you know and I said well I got this lick I think you need to go in if possible you need to go into these songwriting appointments with some bits and pieces I call them song scrap so we built the song around the lick and his idea for a title, and I did a little demo of it. And the demo was really pretty thorough. It had uh, good guitar parts and a good vocal from Webb on it. I played it for Joe McMahon. He goes, yeah, it's pretty cool. He said, I just don't know what to do with it. And I swear we couldn't even figure out what beat to play it to. The way that the song was constructed, the order of the parts, it just really was not working. And Tom's ideas were real simple, but he just kind of said, let's take that out and let's move this here. So I was really working on trying to get a better order for the song, and I, and I came up with something that I felt was really good. Since you've been gone, I've been hanging around and moping, foolishly. I put the CD in Dan's mailbox. He doesn't suffer a fool gladly. I had no idea what he would think about it. And uh, a couple of weeks passed, ring, the phone rings, it's him. He said, I didn't know our song was that good. People will always say, just be yourself. And I completely didn't do that early on because the, the Web Wilder character was a film thing that I then took to the musical stage. I don't do the character so much anymore, and I haven't in years, and nobody's complained. As my life went on, because it's been going a while now, whoever I am and whoever that character was picked up attributes from one another, and, and, and somewhere in the middle you get the 21st century Web Wilder. That's been kind of happy for me to find out that uh, I don't have to wear a mask.
Sometimes I wish I was uh, maybe more driven to specifically be, you know, a writer or specifically compelled to be an actor or something, but my default setting is that of a performer. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's no joke. Admit it. Well, I got you thus far. Don't you dare repair, ain't nothing broke around here. What color is that hood? Woo! It's when it's right, I mean, I'm the first one to say it, you feel like you're surfing about six inches off the ground, and sometimes you don't. You bound to get it. Now, if you're like I am and think that music still sounds best on vinyl, then you need to know about this place. This is the little big store in Raymond, and owner Betty Strachan has been in business for decades. And if you think about it, that's decades when vinyl was challenged by CDs and digital downloads, until finally, once again, vinyl is back in style, as it should be. I ride alone with the thunder and the rain. Well, we've had people from France, England, all of Europe, uh, Africa, Sweden. Sometimes they come in off the Natchez Trace and they're attracted to the appearance of the building, I'm sure. My name is Betty Strachan. I'll omit my age. <laughs> I believe that I am the largest record store in the South. I'd say there's um, over a million pieces. A lot of places have closed now whenever the record, you know, just died. A lot of places closed, so I held on, and maybe due to that fact, I have more records than probably, um, I don't know, in the United States, but I'd be somewhere in the top. And I started with crafts because I had no money to start. And uh, I could get the crafts from the Craftsman's Guild at no charge and then pay them when I sold the craft. Then I bought some records as an aside and they started selling, so I kind of just went that direction. The first records I bought were new and I just bought, bought them from somebody that had them. Um, and then uh, one of my customers said, you ought to start buying used vinyl. Uh, they do that in other cities, and uh, you might, you know, do good. And so I put a sign up buying records, and they came in. And then during the 80s and 90s, everybody got rid of their albums in favor of the CD, the new uh, format. And, um, and so I was able to buy a whole lot of records. That period was good. I was still selling records. Um, records were still holding on just fine. It was, it was after the CD gained so much popularity that uh, people didn't want their records at all anymore, and they just wanted rid of them. The things got really slow. Um, the download became the most popular thing, and uh, people quit buying CDs. They quit buying vinyl and went mostly for the download. A whole new generation kind of sprung up and they were into the whole retro thing and into vinyl more than ever. And, um, and a lot of companies have started pressing vinyl again. Vinyl, you get so much and as a collectible, it'll always be collectible. And you're holding in your hand something from that era that um, um, that is real and tangible. It's just a warm, nice sound. It's a wonderful sound. It's natural. And it was a piece of art, essentially. You know, when I opened the store, I only wanted to be doing this for a couple of years. I couldn't imagine anything longer than two years. 
I just came to work every day and the years piled up, you know. This year will be the 35th year that uh, I've been in business. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping to die behind the counter. Well, all music lovers know about the Grammys, and most music lovers know about the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles. Maybe not a lot of music lovers know that there is another Grammy Museum now. It's not New York, it's not Nashville, it's in Cleveland. And no, not Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Mississippi. Let's go there. Ago, we hired Alan Hammonds from Greenwood to come up with some ideas about what we could do to get tourism in Cleveland. So he had done a great job at the B.B. King Museum. And as we were brainstorming, one day he said, why don't we see about a Grammy Museum for Cleveland, Mississippi? And we said, well, you know, that's probably an impossibility, but whatever you say, we'll try. Back several years ago when Haley Barber was governor, he established a relationship with the Recording Academy in L.A. because Mississippi has the most Grammy winners per capita of any other state. So with that relationship already established, we made a pitch to the Recording Academy and the Grammy Museum to be able to do a Grammy Museum here in Mississippi. And they, they were very intrigued by the idea. They liked it. It's my understanding that the next museum after this, if everything falls into place, would be in Beijing. So you've got Los Angeles, Beijing, Cleveland, Mississippi. I can't say enough about how the communities felt. We got going on this. We talked to the state about funding and all. And they said, well, we want to see what kind of local interest you can support first. So we went out and we were very lucky. We had a lot of generous people here in Cleveland that were willing to put up a lot of money to make this work. And so when we went to the state, uh, they had a listening ear because we had already raised a great deal of money. Museum Mississippi, there's a great segment that's devoted to the history of the recording process as well as the history of Mississippi music and all the people that are involved. You know, the recording process is very, it's very complicated from what the end consumer gets when you put that song in the radio, your CD player, or your iPod that you love so much. It took an enormous amount of people to get it to that point. Recording engineers, publicists, promoters, stylists and all of those parts of the industry are reflected here in the Grammy Museum. One of the really neat exhibits that we have here will be what we call singer-songwriter production. We have music pods and you go in and you have an interactive on the screen with Kibmo. And he's saying, let's write a blues song today. And here's where I think we want to start it and I want you to help me finish it out. You got a microphone and so you sing in and you tape it. After you finish it, then you forward it to the production pod. And there, you'll hear the song being sung, and it'll be to some basic music. You have the opportunity then to be an engineer. If you want to beef up your bass, you can beef up your bass. If you think you need some horns, add some horns. Then you can send it to yourself, to your email address, so you have a take home. And in addition to that, we put it in our database, and we plan to check out all the different entries and do some sort of scholarship award or something like that to, to the winner. There are a lot of factors that brought this museum to the Delta and to Cleveland. Uh, first and foremost is all sorts of music have come through Mississippi. So the decision was made to come to this state, to this city, and to this campus 
because we have such a great uh, vision for music and culture here, and because we have the Delta Music Institute, an outstanding music department, an art department, and other things that support what's going to be a wonderful addition to the Delta for our culture and for our music. And one of the visions for Delta State for the next 25 years will be music and culture focused. And when you add this Grammy Museum, it develops for us a wonderful package. You know, Cleveland, Mississippi is itself a fairly small town, and so you wonder, well, why here? But the fact remains that so much of the technology in the last 20, 30 years has changed fundamentally how we do business. Whereas when I left Mississippi years ago to go to Nashville to pursue my career, I had to go. But that was before the internet and before all the technology that's available to us now. We hope that you know, young people put down roots here, stay here. It's a great place to live. And so we can grow that culture of a, a small music industry here, then Cleveland, we hope, will begin to look a little bit something like Austin, a little bit of something like Nashville, a little bit of something like Atlanta. The talent's here. We just have to begin to educate our students as to how to put the business around that talent and then keep it here in Mississippi. It's going to be our economic engine for the next decade, I think. It's by far the biggest thing outside of Delta State being built here. It's happened to us in, in many decades. So we think it's going to be an eye-opener to the world. People love coming to the Delta of Mississippi from all over the U.S., from all over the world. We want to see Dockery, one of our great blue sites, five miles outside of Cleveland. They want to go to Po Monkeys up in Marigold to see a true juke joint. And now they'll get to do all of that and come to this museum. So it's a beautiful combination. The symmetry will be perfect. You know, I grew up in a very small town in southwest Mississippi. I graduated here at Delta State and then went off to pursue my career in the professional music industry. And nobody ever told me that I couldn't do it. And I was very encouraged along the way to think that I could. And that's another part of what we want to do is encourage young people that even if they're from a small town uh, from Mississippi, they can go do this. The next guest to the podium, you have seen this man every year for as long as you've been watching the Grammys on TV. And I know everybody in Mississippi recognizes him because when somebody comes from out of town, we know exactly who you are. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the president, CEO of the Recording Academy, Mr. Neil Portnow. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. And good morning, everybody. It is still is morning, right? Uh, it's really an honor to be here, and it's actually turning out to be quite an emotional day for me, um, having been at the Academy now for 15 years and watching our dreams come true. Uh, I was actually standing in the hall this morning and meeting some of the folks here, uh, and I learned a new phrase, which uh, I will take with me um, wherever I go, uh, which really talks about today. And that phrase is, it's a great day for the Delta. Would you agree? You know, part of the Recording Academy's mission is to ensure that music remains an indelible part of our culture. That's our mission, it's in our statement. And that is exactly what the Grammy Museum Mississippi will do. Provide a place for visitors to get up close and personal with music, exploring the important role it's played in our society and the special process that goes into creating it. Here, you will not just see, hear, learn, or create music, you will actually experience it. Thank you so much for helping us bring the Grammy Museum Mississippi to life. I hope you all enjoy more of the wonderful music we have in store for you all day today and all night tonight and for the years to come. Enjoy the Grammy Museum Mississippi. Thank you all so much. That's about all the time we have for this episode. Remember, if you would like information about anything you've seen, you can always contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads. And remember to like us on our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. Till next time, I'm Walk Racing. I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. <laughs>
Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You know, we really enjoy bringing you Mississippi Roads every week. We appreciate you watching it. And we really appreciate those of you who support Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Because your support of MPB not only helps programs like ours stay on the air, but other MPB productions. Your contributions support everything from MPB original documentaries to MPB radio shows, to MPB's literacy outreach programs in homes and schools statewide, to programs like our reading services for the blind and our emergency communication services during hurricanes and other disasters. You see, we do a lot of MPB, and we depend on you to help us do it. If you'd like to contribute now, please go to our website, mpbonline.org, and click Donate Now in the top right corner. Because when you do that, you're helping MPB help all Mississippians. Because like we say, Mississippi is our mission.